Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Hey gang, welcome to another episode of Weird Web Radio. I'm bringing you another repeat guest because... Evo Dominguez is just that goddamn awesome. <laughs> and I'm glad that you're here to listen. Evo's got a great new book coming out about the elements, and I highly recommend that you go get it. And we get into a pretty deep discussion about a lot of esoteric topics on this show, and I hope you enjoy it and get a lot of traction out of it. Meanwhile, you know the drill. If you want to get the extra content, you go to join our Patreon membership at weirdwebradio.com. Click join that membership or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio. And this particular one, we play it a little differently with Evo since he's already been here before as a prior guest. And it was a lot of fun to do this show. So as always, I appreciate you all being here. I thank you for being a part of the, uh, the audience and stay weird out there, my friends. Okay, we're recording. Evo Dominguez, welcome back to Weird Web Radio. It's great to have you here. I'm really happy to be back here. <laughs> it was fun last are. time. Yeah, <laughs> let's hope it's even more fun this time. You are taking right. the maiden voyage on my ability to see your face and you see mine as I record. This is fun. <laughs> you know, it, for me, it really makes a difference. Uh, one of the things that uh, I miss is human contact during the uh, era of COVID. And though Zoom's okay and up to a point, uh, there's so many calls I'm on where it's just a voice and I like seeing people's facial responses. It's it's more of a conversation. Mm -hmm. I agree. It 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 allows more of those subtle cues, I think, to show yeah. up. So shout out to Zencaster, who has powered this podcast for the last almost five complete years now to finally give us the ability to do that. I appreciate it. So any of you out there looking to start a podcast, I recommend you come check out Zencaster. And that's the end of their ad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy, you have written a new book because the world can never get enough of what Evo thinks. And I'm glad huh. you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I am truly glad you've done it. Um, this one is titled Four Elements of the Wise, Working with Magical Power of Earth, Air, Water, and Fire. Yep. Why did this book need to be written? Honestly, uh, because uh, after looking to see what was available and responding to questions when I gave workshops, it was clear to me that it had been a while since there was a fresh take on the elements, but more importantly, familiarity breeds contempt. And uh, there is so much material about the four elements available. And almost all of it is uh, pretty much a copy and paste and uh, put somewhere else and repurposed content on different websites and blogs. And it's all the same material. And it tends not to go very deep. And unfortunately, that makes people think that that's the, all there is. And I think one of the biggest challenges in modern paganism, modern heathenry, modern any kind of magic is that it's easy to develop diminished expectations and think that you've seen all there is. You've reached the end of the internet. You've reached the end, end of the blogosphere. You've read everything there is about the topic. So I said, I'm going to go and write something that would be worthy for somebody who's brand new to this or somebody who's been around for a long time, because it's about talking about not just lists of correspondences, but perhaps some of the interrelationships and meanings of why it's a useful model for looking at the universe and looking at magic. That, in, uh, in a sense, I view all my books as actually one book. Uh, they're just kind of like uh, mega chapters because uh, I actually love teaching. and I love teaching in person, and I actually hate writing. <laughs> it is it, got a it funny is a, way of showing it. <laughs> man, it's an ordeal. I have to, like, force myself. I, 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 it's almost like I've got to set up all the little doggy, you know, Scooby Snacks, uh, I, I, if I get this many wor words done, I can do the following thing. If I do the next chapter, I can, uh, you know, go watch whatever I'm watching on, on Netflix currently. So it becomes a, a thing because I enjoy teaching, but I like having interaction with people. But my books are a way of making available the material that is in my in-person stuff, knowing that 
you know, there's only so many people I'm ever going to meet in my life. So, and honestly, the books last in a way that I won't. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you said something there that I think is really interesting because I had the, I had nearly the very same thought this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it it occurred to me because you know I'm I was talking to some people about different things and letting them know that I was going to be interviewing you today, and it occurred to me I have a few of your books that your books are very much like I've grabbed a book on witchcraft or sorcery or something. And the, the, there's always the chapter headings and here's how a brief introduction to the thing. And here are some exercises. Right. Now we're on to the next thing and on to the next thing. And mm -hmm. it's, it's as if you have taken those chapter headings and decided to take super deep dives. So you get a very good, deep understanding of it. And I've, I've come to appreciate your books that way. I always want people to understand why I think something works. You know, they can develop uh, their own ideas about it because if you can't pop the hood and understand what's going on underneath, you can't adjust it and you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't yeah. matter uh, what system it is. Uh, there's more to it. Well, let, that's not quite true. If, if your work is purely devotional, maybe you don't need to know uh, the technical stuff related to the metaphysics or the magic. But if you include the magical component then having different ways of understanding how things fit together and what the process is, that's to me a thousand times more important than having memorized, uh, you know, 1200 invocations. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that's a really cool distinction too. You bring up if you're, if your practice is devotional, perhaps you don't have to yeah. take the deeper dive into the practical applications. Right. So, I mean, <sighs> How much of your work do you think crosses that line back and forth, devotional to practical? Well, surely there there is a mixture of the things, <clears throat> and every individual is going to have a different place with that. I can say that uh, my, technically I, I'm not devotional. Mm -hmm. uh, in some regards, uh, people say, "Well, but 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 you have such good relationships with you know in the name of variety of." Um, goddesses, gods, or, or or divine beings of one kind or other that I've, I've worked with, or I've embodied doing divine possession kind of things, et cetera. And I said, you know, but I am not devotional. I don't think I have a devotional bone in my body. However, I have respect. I have I consider myself a student of, a child of, an ally of. I have a lot of different roles in my head that I uh, adopt in relationship to different beings. But um, I think. There's not even when I was a, a kid and being raised Catholic, and uh, by the way, Cuban Catholic is extra in a lot of ways. <laughs> it's extra. It's <laughs> leveled a, up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a lot of in a lot of ways. Lots of candles, lots of stained statues, lots of you know borderline uh, folk magic that's considered normal part of your you know daily Catholicism. But no, but nonetheless, uh, you know I I but I also when kids. Kids develop heroes, right? Uh, and people would ask me, "Oh, who's your hero?" When I'm when I was a kid, it's like I don't have any. I can say I really like you know that teacher. I really like that author. I really like that musician, but not in that sense. However, I respect them. So for me, when I do my idea of devotional work, uh, as a for example, um. I wrote a series of, uh, of songs and poems uh, for a friend who was uh, setting up a, a, long exp a long devotional weekend. And I viewed that as a gift to that particular uh, goddess. Even though I wasn't going to be participating in it, but uh, I was doing work on their behalf. But, th but that sense of being enfolded in the power or the love, I feel a sense of awe often, but it's not the same thing as feeling like I belong. I don't know. I think everybody's idea of devotional is going to be different. So I can, from the outside, I would have people say, You've, wow, you, you just, you know, filled yourself up and let that being walk you around the room and speak through your voice and <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's a very intense and very intimate and private experience. And I'm not their priest. Mm. Uh, 
And, and I think part of it is my choice is uh, flexibility and uh, working with different communities. I think I mentioned it to you maybe uh, the last time. I'm not sure. Like, for example, Odin, Odin and I have a very complicated relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, I don't want to work with you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> how, though, though he knocks on the door with some regularity and shows up in a lot of ways in my life. However, I have so many friends for whom that's a core, uh, core part of who they are. So whenever I am asked to, will you participate in this ritual? Will you, will you come um, ward while I do safe or whatever it is somebody's doing? I'm going to spend time ahead of time doing Little little offerings, little libations and saying, I'm not one of yours, but I am a dear friend and ally to one of yours. I will be working on your behalf. So so that I I, I make a, a I probably spend more time, honestly, being quote unquote non-devotional, trying to make sure that any time that I'm going to be working with a particular entity that I that I uh, set up a proper uh, introduction and negotiation and then can gracefully bow out again. And what I, by the way, the one that works with him for me, at least, is I've already made an oath that I'm going to be a bridge builder between multiple pantheons, so I can't make any oaths to you. <laughs> 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 but that's, but, but the short form is that in some regards, my choice not to be devotional to a thing is because I view my work as more about interconnection. But that doesn't stop me from, it looks devotional from the outside, but honestly, I think that's because to some degree, we've forgotten what respectful behavior looks like with uh, beings that are huge and vast. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I, I've, I've run myself into that distinction, I guess, sometimes where I have to explain it sometimes to myself mm -hmm. and sometimes to others that I, I much like you, I don't feel like I'm devotional in the slightest, but someone could watch me do my daily work and see me yes. make offerings and call my yes. allies. And I have statues to the, the main deities, the God sized right. spirits that I work with. Yep. Odin among them. Yep. <laughs> yep. And many of my friends. And, and the, and it probably looks an awful lot like some kind of devotional practice from the outside looking in. But for me, it's not that. And I don't, I, I'm not sure how I would explain that it's not though to anyone other than the fact that when I see devotion, I know it when I see it and, and maybe that's how they feel too, but it's just not that for me. <laughs> I, I, I think I, you know, I, I agree. I, I mean, I've, I've seen people, I have people in my life that I go, yep, they've got that glow. They've got that look in their eyes. They're having the, the equivalent of religious ecstasy. They're, they're in communion with their being. Um, and, What I, what I tell people sometimes is, look at all the stuff I do for various uh, gods, goddesses, uh, divine beings, and then compare that on a different, it's a different thing on a different scale. But don't I do that with my close friends? I mean, I will, it, it becomes a thing where this is how you treat people. If you respect yeah. them, if you value them, if they mean something in your life. But if one of them said, Evo, I want you to do blah, blah, blah. I'm going to balk and ask why and uh, uh, look at whether or not it impinges upon what future plans or growth I have for things that I think are important as well, because I don't grant them. And this is probably a, a leftover reaction from my departure from Catholicism, but I don't believe in omni anything. Nothing's omniscient. Nothing's all powerful. If it if it's if it's if it's if you have that as part of the bag of tricks, then I go well. Um, what may be best for your agenda may not be best for my agenda, so I don't give up that. And whereas I see people that are truly devotional, and this is not the same thing as being weak willed or, but they've made a choice of fully pledging and committing their purposes to the purposes of that being. Hmm. That's a very, very precise example. I think you nailed it on the head. And maybe that's where the real difference lies is that we may be willing to work with these beings and, and honor them and respect mm -hmm. them in the ways that are appropriate. But I'm not about to oath bound myself <laughs> to anything, especially super powered in that way. No. Uh, with yeah. as many great way, ways that they have, they have as many flaws. And I certainly 
it's just not i don't feel compelled and and i yeah. don't see anything wrong with the people who do i just no no not at all compelled to to tie my my fate to their desires that way mm-hmm. and maybe we don't get a choice in the end who knows but i'm not willingly walking into that deep of a relationship it, it, it's a complicated thing uh the same way that people talk about predestination mm-hmm. uh, i have uh, a relative who <clears throat> uh, took the route of santeria which you know and and she was like i don't understand why didn't you follow this route with me <laughs> Because it didn't call to me for one, um, but she said it's okay, it's okay. We'll we'll get you next lifetime around, because in in the house that she's in, the teaching is that everyone's head belongs to one of the uh, uh, one of the Orishas. and whether you not you're initiated or adopted in this life, it doesn't matter. You're still part of them, but sooner or later, one of these lives, you'll come you'll come around and join us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've got it all figured out that way. <laughs> well, good for them. Well, good for them. And, but, yeah. and, and I, I guess, I guess my response uh, to, to all that is okay, maybe. Um, but until then, um, I wish you well in what you're doing. And this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I have just decided at some point we're going to have to have you and John Beckett on the show at oh, the yeah. same time. Yeah, I love John. I, lo- I love John Beckett. Yeah. Though he is like so, you know, it, we're we're all not exactly 180 degrees, but pretty close. That that that's my thought exactly. And we're going to have a discussion on devotional and practical. I think it'll be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, yeah. we really took a left turn there, didn't uh, we? I know. Let's get I back know. to your book. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we're here to sell books, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm all sure right. my publisher um, will be happy with that too. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So going back to, again, sure. to that first thing that you said uh, that spurred that whole conversation, um, a beginner's view of the elements. So why do you think people stall their development in working with elements? Why is it just sort of a quick set of things that they will u- usually encounter in a witchcraft book or a hermeticism book and not go much deeper? Well. For some people, it's because you can get actual results without going any deeper. Hmm. Uh, it, it, it's it's relatively accessible to use the four elements individually or in combination to cause effects, to cause oper- to do operative magic, to make things happen that you desire. So, if you are satisfied with those results, then you may not necessarily have a feeling that you need to go any deeper. I think there's another thing as well that is even magical folks in the society have a big dollop of uh, literalism and a big dollop of idolatry mixed in with them. Mm -hmm. And the plus and minus of having things be physical symbols, honestly, and people go, yes, you know, I have a glass filled with water. I have a cup full of water. That's the element of water. I have a candle flame in front of me. That's fire, right? I, I just felt a breeze uh, come in through the window. That's air, right? I've got, I'm standing on the earth or I'm holding a rock. That's earth. And in effect, those physical representations, though, on the one hand, they make it easy to connect initially to the concept, become a limiting factor because it's hard to imagine that those are just pale stands, stand-ins for what each of those elements are in a broader sense and in different realms of reality so that the, the objects become the totality of it. And people start doing things like, well, you know, uh, they, they start basically uh, playing uh, rock, paper, scissors with, with the elements and seeing how they uh, work with or against each other. And that's, and that's all very useful to, to get ideas down. But I was talking to somebody a few days ago, totally different topic. We were talking herbs and, and uh, that kind of magic. And they made some comment about working with fire elementals when they were trying to do particular work. And I, and I said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I, I've been listening to you for the last half hour and this is true, but you have to understand that uh, fire is more than, than the candles in the, in the bonfire fire is more even than the sun that's in the sky right now. Fire is present 
everywhere in the universe where you see a star blazing bright. It is vaster and older than any of us as, as a concept and as a being. And if you believe all things have life of a form, and I do, um, then the elements are older and vaster in some regards than many of those beings that we regard as gods and goddesses. Mm. I mean, they pre-exist. And, and simply because something is a one trick pony or only is a one note thing, people go, well, but it's just all fire or all water, or all air. Indeed. But there are plenty of virtuosos in the world that are violinists or painters or dancers or mathematicians or whatever, and you don't expect them to be great at everything, but the, but the elements are absolutely virtuosos of the things that they are. And that category is broader. It's also people get stuck in the elements being about human personality. Almost all the initial beginner stuff points to the elements as your will or your emotions, or you, you, there's a correlation to, to something that's a human characteristic. And not that that isn't true, but also the elements apply to everything that is in physical manifestation uh, and everything that is in the planes or realms or worlds that are near us as well. So it's a lot more. So I, I think people get stuck because quick magic is easy. And then I've got a physical representation. I'm going to focus on that. And let's not even get into when people decide that the tools that they uh, assign to the elements are in some way inherently that element. Oh, no, I insist. Let's get into it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, one, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. I, I mean, honestly, if, uh, if, if truly the elements are, by the way, do I think that the elements are um, the only way to look at the universe that works? Absolutely not. I think that there's a lot of different ways to look at the universe, same way that we have different uh, keys for music or different uh, scales of reference for, for measuring the universe. They all work in their own fashion, um, and each of them has strengths and weaknesses. So I'm not saying that this is the only way, because there are plenty of other that work perfectly well. Uh, however, um, there's a lot of flexibility in this one, and it's dovetailed into a lot of other systems. But here's the thing with the tools, because I got off track again. The deal with the tools is that the elements are older than humans making, uh, you know, anything. We, we at some point said, hey, cupping my hands to uh, get water is nice, but wouldn't it be nice if I had a shell or a little clay basin or something to uh, take a sip of water? But uh, the first... Water was there first. Uh, humans eventually created objects that had symbolic and utilitarian things attached to them that when they said, hey, this will be the stand-in for our anchoring point to that element. But it is human created. That doesn't make it any less. It's just because it's a social construct or a cultural construct does not make it any less from a magical perspective. But once again, when people think that the power is in the tool, they've lost the whole point. Mm. Yeah, I think I, that's very valid. Um, something that you said in the book that I really loved and I wanted to unpack a little bit. You say the knowledge and wisdom is not linear in metaphysical and occult teachings. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's an example from your own work that can make better illustrate that statement? Okay. Uh how about let, let's do, let's do uh, joining uh, different levels of reality and different scales and, and different materials. And I use this example for a bunch of other things, but uh, let's say at some point in your life, and I'm pretty sure you have, you've watched some old cheesy uh, swashbuckling <laughs> pirate movie, and yeah. uh, it's it's in black, <laughs> right, right, and it's in black and white or color doesn't matter, but we can start with the black and white ones. And you look at the special effects and you go, man, that is a little wooden model boat bobbing around in, in, in a tub. Uh, that, and that's supposed to represent uh, that they're in the middle of this big storm, right? And you instantly know that it is a small boat in a small tub because the waves are too smooth. They move like, like more like sine waves. They don't curl over and crash. They don't uh, foam up. There's not the kind of chop that you see on the broad ocean. Why? Because in that scale, at that size, 
water behaves like that. Mm. It holds together in a particular way so that it does not uh, curl and crash and it doesn't form waves that we identify as ocean waves. At a certain size, that becomes possible. When we look at water in, in at different scales, whether it's fine, if you go down to the level of a droplet, it's more likely to want to form um, a perfect sphere as much as it can within its environment because it's it has that magnetic cohesive power that brings it together. Water has that magnetic power. And then as you increase its scale or change its density, and what am I going to talk about changing density? Water doesn't just exist as physical water. There's water that exists in every realm of reality, every world of reality that surrounds the physical. And if you if you like the uh, less dense um, to, to a more dense model, that works great. But the idea is that water in each of those places is going to react in accordance to place, the nature of, of the material of that place, because the mater- energy and matter isn't the same in other places. But the rule is still the same. Water is still trying to hold itself together. Water is still seeking its level. So on the one hand, you've got the broad teachings about these are the things that are the nature of water. And then you apply them to different places and different scales and different materials and see how does it play in that unique environment. So you have to be able to hold on to these teachings that are presented as big truths, knowing that almost every big truth is almost useless in and of itself. It's like saying, <laughs> it's, it's like saying E equals MC squared, big whoop. However, knowing that uh, there's that equivalence between energy and matter in a particular way allows a whole plethora of understandings and applications and theories to come into being. So when we say that water is the magnetic element, water is the condensing element, uh, water seeks its own level, water seeks to descend, that's always true, but it looks totally different and behaves totally differently depending upon where in the universe, both physical and and other, we exist. So you have to mix the linear and the nonlinear, this kind of like essence idea with this uh, mixing it into the real world. I hope you're all taking notes. (laughs) Go buy the book. (laughs) I, 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 I will say that uh, I'm glad this is finally coming out. I don't know if anybody, the, well, because it got kind of delayed because of COVID. If, if you look at, if you read the forward, the forward was uh, uh, written in August of 2020. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the book actually was, was supposed to come out uh, early ish uh, last year, but I, I guess it was a, a better choice to say, we're good. We're going to wait. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm sure people are going to enjoy it. Um, something else you write about in the book are the four powers of the mages. Yeah. And, and it, you also talk about how that relates to the witch's pyramid. Yep. Uh, let's dig into those two things, especially, you know, like since it's associated with the elements and you wrote about it, what are the four powers of the mages? Well, you've, you've probably heard them as the four powers of the Sphinx or any number of other things. It's, you know, the power to know, the power to dare, the power to be silent, the power to go. You've probably seen some variation of these, I'm sure. And generally speaking, when people talk about them, they get really caught up in, man, how do I put this? Once again, literalism. Hmm. Once again, people people are going to go, well, um, the power to keep silent, the power to will. So at least... Once a year, I run into a big, what does it mean, the power to keep silent? And and some people argue, oh, that's crappy. That means you shouldn't speak up. Other people say, oh, no, that means that you shouldn't uh, tell people what your spell work was until it's done so that their thoughts and energies don't disrupt the uh, manifestation of it, et cetera, et cetera. Or the power to will. Or, but here's the thing. These are all, to a degree, valid, but the powers are viewed as... Um, once again, uh, simple extensions or understandings of, of human personality. So let me give you a couple of things that the power to be silent also can be. The power to be silent is also to know things in the absence of linear language, which instinct is an example of that, that some people, though it's, but even then I'm going to say that for most human beings, instinct is 
something that is tenuous and hard to identify until it happens or they express it themselves. Because when you, I, I keep bees. When you look at bees uh, at work building and doing things, or if you look at uh, animals uh, building uh, dams on rivers or whatever, it's like they have a incredible amount of understanding of how the universe works and how material works. And it is without words and to some degree, even without imagery. Uh, so the power to be silent is also the power to tap into the parts of yourself that does not speak uh, human language, but understands the form language of the universe. Uh, to keep silence often associated with earth. Let me give you an example of form language. Uh, for people who uh, have been paying attention to things like uh, the COVID vaccines it's, and so on, almost all of the magic there is about making something that is the right shape to connect to the right uh, part of the cell membrane so that it fits like lock and key to connect and teach. It's all about the shape of it. The shape is its truth. And there's no, no language there. It is the, the way that the, at, at the atomic level, uh, those things fit together. If you want a visual image, the way the lock and key works, that, that, you, that you see how things are. The universe does not have a user's manual or a set of rules, but it does have a series of ways in which the physical things and powers can interact. So to keep silent is to get out of the way so that you're no longer uh, cluttering uh, your sense of self and psyche with human gibbering. And actually have a more gestalt, direct feeling for or knowledge of the universe. That's a totally different thing. The power to to uh, to will is often caught up with people confusing passion for willpower. Not that they're not related, but but they but they really are. But they really are different things. And uh, I'm actually going to throw in that. Uh, fire being associated with will and being associated with life is important because in a lot of ways, the big thing about life is life says no to the universe. Life is, you know, swim swims upstream. Life is basically an attempt to uh, thumb its nose at entropy. I'm not going to fall apart. I'm going to keep trying to put myself back together and I'm going to keep going and uh, the will to live is is the is is the fire of life saying i will continue to build at the same time i will build faster i will push forward faster than i am being degraded mm. so i mean so that the witch's pyramid is more than uh, a a quick glyph for hey if i want to write a spell that works i need to pay attention to these things and the pyra the tip of the pyramid at the top uh to go or intention or goal. Honestly, uh, in some witch traditions, uh, the witch's pyramid is also viewed as a variant of the cone of power. And basically you're raising the energy, focusing it until it reaches that point at the top and boom, it gets sent forth. But it's, it's, it's a bit more than that. It, it, it applies to uh, Kabbalah. It can be applied to Kabbalah. It can be applied to some Pythagorean uh, ways of understanding how the universe fits together. I guess what I'm saying is if something is really simple uh, and whether it's the elements or the witch's pyramid, which is another uh, way of saying the four elements plus spirit, those spirit and ether and quintessence are a whole nother thing. Uh, if it looks simple, then beware. What you're actually looking at is the the innocuous front door to another reality. And And most times you're just happy that you found the door and you don't actually step through. But for the people that step through... All these seemingly simple things are no longer simple, but filled with wonder. Spirits and ether and quintessence. Oh yeah, are a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Somebody out there, I bet more than one somebody went. What's he mean by that? So right, right. Spirits and ether and quintessence are different things. I know I use them in in writing and in work as different things but what do you mean when you're saying spirits ether, yeah and, and and there's lots of language uh differences depending on people and traditions and whatnot uh and there are also quite a few people that use ether spirit and quintessence as basically equivalent words as synonyms direct synonyms for each other and there's nothing wrong with that but i found it useful to view them as 
different facets of the same thing. So, for example, uh, ether, to my way of defining it, when you bring the four elements together and uh, join them and they become the one thing again, kind of Captain Planet. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably a bunch of people had some variation of that in their in their uh, if either themselves or, or or their kids but when the four elements come together they become ether they become something that is uh, more than and in in that sense for me ether represents the up swell from life it's the forest luke it's uh when the, th the things that are of this world join together and rise upwards to join to whatever your concept of of the ultimate is above. So ether is what happens when the elements uh, reintegrate and become one thing on the way up. Spirit is my word for the descending power that splits into many things and becomes the four elements and all the things in the world. So you've got one that's the up current and one is the down current. And they, in a sense, they are the same thing, but uh, in a different phase. Uh, it's, think of it as a, a cycle or a circulation of, of 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 essence that goes up from earth and down from above, whatever that means for you. However, there is the wonky place where the two currents meet, where the above and below meet, and it's kind of becomes the middle point or the middle place uh, or the 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 little swirling vortex where the where the two currents meet. And that's what I call quintessence because it's neither the above nor the below. It's, it contains qualities of both the upwelling of eminence and the, uh, the, the downward uh, power that comes from, from the transcendent realms. And it isn't really a thing. It's an art, it exists as an artifact of the two things meeting, but it in and of itself is not a separate thing. The same way that, I view our consciousness as not being a real thing in and of itself, but it's, but as a, a product of the things that are, are above and below meeting together. And a lot of magic takes place in that liminal middle place. So I'm going to say that quintessence is basically the liminality that comes into being because we have both an above and below meeting. And one is about uniting and one is about differentiating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're not, we're not far off in agreement there. I've, I've always kind of, I use talk about quintessence a lot and things that I do thinking of, you know, if, if you view all the things that exist and then mm -hmm. everything is connected as, you know, this web or right. as I've come, I've come to call it thanks to Aiden Walker, the field. Oh yes. Um, uh, if you were to zoom in real close, mm -hmm. if you could see the field as a thing mm -hmm. and you were to zoom in super close, it's quintessence that is it's built up and holding it all together. Yes. You know, it's yeah, that's how, and I don't think you're saying anything very different. We're just saying it in different ways. Yeah. I, I mean, we aren't, we aren't really. Um, and, and it's, and in some regards, uh, the world becomes more magical when you, uh, decide that something as evanescent and ephemeral and constantly changing, but always present and fills every place and touches everything in, in a way it is that, that uh, quintessence that is the joining of the above and the below is the only reason why it's possible for us to communicate with anything. It's the thing that allows us to commune with plants, crystals, spirits, gods or goddesses, it's that little spark of something that is our little internal compass and Rosetta Stone that connects us to those things. I dig it. I and dig without it. that, we're and with and, and and should we ever lose that, uh, then we're screwed. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I think I think if we ever lost what, whatever quintessence truly is, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure anything exists anymore. Yeah, so, I, well. We'd lose this creation. How's that? We'd lose this this world yeah, as yes. th yeah, this world as we know it. I I, I think it's I'm one of those. Uh, I think it's really hard to get rid of the universe, though it's really easy to get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gets it. That gets into those. You ever listen to physicists argue with each other? And I happen right. to know a couple real physicists yep. on whether the universe is infinite or or it turns back on itself. 
And, yeah, and then and then yeah. he started. Throwing, they start to sound like mystics in a hurry. <laughs> they do, they do, especially and, and when throw in the multiverse, and, and we're good, we're good to go. Now, yeah, one, you're not so different from us. That's what we're no, saying. No, <laughs> they're not. They're not. I did have a, a friend that passed away many years ago who uh, was a physics professor at the University of Delaware, and uh, he claimed to be a hardcore agnostic. Hmm. A hardcore, maybe. <laughs> That's and very but, Robert Anton Wilson of him. <laughs> very, it really was. And, uh, the, but we used to have long, long talks and honestly, it was a very good deception he pulled on himself because, because he, whenever he spoke about, uh, he, his, uh, especially was astrophysics. Whenever he spoke, it was like, how are you not viewing, seeing that what you're just saying is, is, uh, somebody else's holy writ. <laughs> right <laughs> but uh I, one thing i'm going to throw in about uh the uh the spirit or, or the fifth element is that in the same way that i don't think that we know everything and every culture discovers things or things come and come to light as they are needed mm-hmm. i i think we're entering into a time period where uh people are going to encounter or work with uh what i'm going to call the uh elemental of ether mm. Um, and I honestly think that we've already encountered it or encountered versions of it, uh, in different forms. Um, I think that when we look at the flows of energy that pass through the environment that some people refer to as ley lines or places where there are concentrations of, of power in the earth or in other places, I actually think that, um, everything that everything is alive and the process of that upswelling, re- the process of rejoining the four elements to become ether, by definition, has to create things that behave as if they were alive by by magical definition. So I think that when people encounter some things that are land spirits, lanvatir, uh, consciousnesses that they apply the idea of, oh, it's a nature spirit, maybe, or it may be that this is what happens when... Uh, the the elementals of that space are joining to become a thing, and I think that mm. each each of us actually already experienced that because uh, I wouldn't, and this is not in my book, but it's a logical extension of it. Because hey, you don't put everything in the book because you're given how many words you can do, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And also, I think some things work better uh, uh, in person or as or as a article. I do mention in the book that part of the process of getting access to the elemental powers is to becoming aware of the fact that you're made of elementals. Mm. Uh, and it's not, not just your personality, which is a, a, a cute little thing to focus on, but uh, your life force, your blood and bones, um, your, the energy field, your aura, your, your subtle bodies, whatever you want to call them are indeed composed of these as well. And when we, when we, become aware of their presence within us and how they they're joining and their flow cre- in, in a sense I'm saying that their upward flow and joining is uh creating what we consider to be the uh, the space between brain and mind a space mm. where where the uh, upwelling of the physical joins uh, our spirit and there's something that happens there that we call this consciousness but when we become aware of those elementals we can become aware of the fact that maybe that's what I am one of those fifth elementals to a degree. I'm actually going to suggest that for some people, uh, the, some of their guides or some of their uh, uh, holy guardian angels or whatever terminology they use in their system may be not just, they could be a separate be- being. And it also may be one of the things that lives within you. I like to point out to everybody that we are like the earth. There are more, aside from the elementals I speak of, there are more cells in our body that are not human, that are that are flora and fauna that live in our gut, live in our skin. Uh, we are percentage wise, we are more something other than human. We are. So all I'm going to say is that we are also inhabited and perhaps that instinct that tells you do this or that part of you that remembers uh, how this was done three generations ago is, is that uh, fifth elemental that has been with you. 
I don't know. Maybe this also connects to, in heathenry to, I don't know, does anybody discuss what the actual nature of somebody's uh, fetch or hamingya is? Oh, you have heathens discuss the nature of something in heathenry? Hmm. No. <laughs> I know a few that do, yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the first rule of heathenry, if you didn't know, is you're doing it wrong. <laughs> no. Um, I think yeah, that's, a, uni- that's a universal human rule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, there are a there, there's different theories um, that have been put forth. There, there's of course these soul complex models mm-hmm. that were put forth by you know um, Edred Thorson years ago. Yep, and, yep, and have carried forward over time. And I actually, I'm it could be just because it's the first one I countered, but it's it's one I'm most familiar with, and I've worked in depth, and I kind of like how it's been spelled mm-hmm. out in a lot of ways. Um, Winifred Rose, who is an elder in the troth and Mm -hmm. just a genuine, wonderful human being. Um, Thankfully, I know her personally. She lives very close by and I've been in ritual with her. She's just great, fantastic Mm -hmm. person. Um, Winifred teaches what she calls heathen soul lore, and she's approaching Mm -hmm. it in a very deep, rich, uh, linguistic way. And Mm -hmm. I think she's very influenced by... um, Anglo-Saxon thoughts as well as wider sure. Germanic thoughts rather than just the Norse as uh, Edred's tended to be. Uh, it It's, yeah. So people have discussed this idea of the Filgia, the Fetch and Hamingia, um, how they're interrelated, how they seem to share certain qualities, mm-hmm. but the, the, the very weird nature of the things that come out of, you know, the heathen magical practices and surviving lore and poetry and so on one word can mean a lot of different things or one phrase can apply to a lot of mm-hmm. different things because many times they're operating in what are called kinnings. You know, this, this thing means right. something else. And, right. and, and it was actually Cat Heath who, who made this point recently, I think will be helpful for, for people understanding more heathen concepts in that, when you're trying to understand these words, you're not always trying to identify the thing as you're looking for characteristics. Mm-hmm. And when you get into the characteristics of Haminya and Filgia, the fetch, I mean, they change shape. They follow right. you. They're said to store right. luck. They could have some influence right. on you. Uh, there's one poem that says you won't see it until it shows you how you're going to die there, you know, like there's all, but yet I know lots of people who have experienced their, their field gear or fetch over time. Uh, and they certainly are still living and breathing. Uh, yeah. Weird. Yeah. But it, it spelled with the Y. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. I, 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 though I think that uh, there's also uh, a distinction between people that intentionally choose a magical spiritual uh, I'm, I'm going to actually try to pop the hood on the universe and see what's going on are likely to have a different experience. And I often tell people when they're looking at different kinds of folklore and uh, I am by, I, I am, I have casual acquaintance with a lot of heathen stuff because of friends. Mm-hmm. But one thing I note in almost every lore everywhere is that it provides material is passed on to give the maximum amount of safety and continuity for the community. And most of the people that actively choose a magical path tend to be outliers. Mm -hmm. Um, So that I'm going to say that most people are unlikely to encounter their, their fetch uh, if they are an average uh, person in the world who is not, actively seeking uh, spiritual or magical experience. But for people that are actively seeking spiritual or magical experience, then that changes the probabilities of, of what you're going to encounter and why. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, one of the things in looking at any lore, and this is also true with the elemental lore, is that the stories you find are practical and true, but for the middle of the curve, not the extremes of the curves of probability. This is what's yeah. going to happen for most people if you do the following things. Oh, oh, you didn't say that you were a fill in the blank for whatever practice it is that you do. Then that puts you in a different category because one of the things that I think is true, whether it is uh, the elementals or any of these 
any beings or, or I'm not even sure what I'm going to call uh, the, the Fetro Heminga. They're, they're definitely, um, they exist, but, uh, but exactly what they are, uh, time will tell. However, you can give people advice about if you encounter them, these are the things that might be safer or less safe to do. And most of the lore is about trying to don't do the following things. Oh, unless you're a magical person. And then it's too late because if you've opened the door, if you can see them, they can see you. If you have been working to expand your senses or open your senses so that you can sense uh, different energies or consciousnesses or presence, then you light up in their reality as much as they light up in yours. One of the things I suggested about the elemental realms, um, and, and, and tell me if we're going where you want to go with this, because, you know, it's your show. Um, hey, I like having a good conversation. That's why I okay, started the show. Okay. It's an excuse to talk to awesome people. <laughs> yeah, I like to talk to that's that's uh, sometimes uh, considered a good point in me and sometimes shut up. So. <laughs> so, oh, I a pet peeve around uh, elemental realms. So if if. If I have one more person say that, well, you know, we open, we call to the elements in the following directions and we assign this one here and this one there. Do you actually literally think that the element of air is to the south? No, no, I don't. Uh, no, I don't. Do you, no. Uh, <clears throat> to compare it to, to the heathen stuff, you know, how many drawings of, of the of uh, the nine realms in the world tree have you seen? And, you know, it's not meant to be a, a subway map, right? It's, it's This is not how you get from point A to point B to point C. Um, and no one will agree how, oh, to, draw, how to draw it anyway. Well, except but. for hell. Hell is north and down. <laughs> and sim <laughs> for symbolic reasons. Probably for the same right. reasons that, but for the same reasons a lot of people say, uh, at least in this hemisphere, that uh, south is fire because that's where the sun is highest in the heavens, you know, at noon or in summertime, blah, blah, blah. But the point is we're using these as uh, reference points. It's kind of like latitude and longitude don't exist, but it's really useful. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when we create a mental map like that, it's useful to get to those realms. But here's the other thing. The, uh, the elemental realms are not like hell or 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 uh or 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 asgard or midgard or whatever or the astral plane or the fey realm uh it it does not follow the rules of geography or uh planes or similar systems because if indeed the elements are uh part of the substrate part of the spiritual material that holds things together and, and helps maintain manifest reality then it's disseminated and dispersed. And it's a question of when you, t it's like in this moment, uh, you're surrounded by, and I am by Wi-Fi signals, cell signals, uh, FM radio, a dozen other things, uh, neutrinos passing through our bodies, lickety split. And we do not perceive them or notice them. But, you know, if we, if we had this magical heads up display that we could put on that's tuned into decoding and perceiving, then suddenly we would see those in, with us. In the same way, the elemental realms are uh, multiplexed and interspersed through everything around us. And it's only when we tune into and decode, tune in and decode, because you actually have to not just tune in, but actually try to engage so that you can understand what you're seeing and, and communicate, then they are present so that their realm exists, uh, but also overlaps. So all the over all the elemental realms actually are present at the same time. They're not to the South or the North. When you open a portal mm -hmm. to one of the realms, uh, it is a useful f way for a human being to wrap their head around the idea of going through and making contact or having them come through. But really um, they are present in all the lower realms. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to draw a line somewhere and say beyond this realm, uh, there are no elements, even though that's what I believe. I can't tell you where that is, but at some point, the elements become one thing again. And at that point, they, there's no need for their separation. I, I see where you're going with that. And, and one thing that it brings to mind is, let's say you're in a circle yep. and you've called, you know, the north, the south, the east, the west, as most would do. As many do, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and some and someone in the town south of you has called created a circle, and they've done their their quarters of north, south, east, yep. and west. But now you exist in their your south quarter exists in their north quarter. <laughs> <laughs> if problem it, of location yeah <laughs> and, it, and it would if if they were actually if they were actually locational rather than than guides for for attunement exactly uh, yeah, other, i think that's yeah the point you got back with the tools and everything else earlier is that sometimes we get too wrapped up in the logical yes. physical aspect of the elements rather than allowing ourselves to sink deeper into its spiritual essence uh, literalism is uh we're died died in the wool we we were all raised on literalism of one form or another <laughs> whether whether or not you came from a uh traditionally religious background or not the culture is very literal um sees mm -hmm. a thing is a thing and and uh things can only be one thing which makes it a lot harder we actually i think in the book i included yeah i did i included a uh, ritual that involves calling water in all four directions. Uh, it's a sub-elements ritual where uh, you call the the air of water, the fire of water, the water of water, the earth of water, and in the center, the spirit of water. So you need not, uh, and for some people, the first time I did that in a public place, it's, it's what, what you do with your own group in your own space, nobody's going to complain too much unless they're doing something crazy or dangerous. But the first time I did it in a public space, it was fun because the mixture of responses was, wow, that was a really great healing ritual. And it was a healing ritual. And I felt so good afterwards, blah, blah, blah. And then there were some people that were like, that was dangerous. Why? You, you, that was, I mean, so many things could have gone wrong. You and, and, and the terrible imbalance of calling just one element. And it's like, um, okay. So here's the other thing. The four element. One of the other reasons that I think I got around to writing this book is that the four elements have also become part of the uh, dogmatic, uh, hidebound uh, stuff in general paganism, hmm. and that's problematic as well. Uh, when when something uh, becomes the the framework for something that ultimately, from my perspective is disempowering uh, because people are taking it as a solid, real thing that is the only way to do things or the only way that uh, it's real or the only way that you can safely, you know, if, if I wanted a fiery chasm to open, there are other rituals that I would use instead of uh, a ritual involving four chalices and, uh, and pouring the waters from, from the four sub elements into a central cauldron and, it was very clearly a very sweet and loving uh, healing ritual, and yet it made some people afraid because it broke the pattern of what they thought was the only safe way to cast. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've been experimenting more and more over the last decade or so with adopting a more animistic mindset in mm -hmm. my magical practice, especially. And one thing that I've really enjoy doing i've been doing this probably for the last 10 years or so now is connecting to the local rivers here uh, and yep. there are three rivers that run through the county that i live in that are you know very important rivers to mm -hmm. different communities one of which is the water supply for my town and and yep. so on uh, and i i make regular offerings and i have i've had this established kind of practice with those three rivers but one thing i like to do sometimes in a ritual if i want to connect with them all at once you've made me think of this you know once in a while i like to call on all three rivers rather than i would be calling on directions or allies or anything yes. of that sort yes it's them specifically and they do they are kind of positioned in different directions of course they twist and wind and otherwise but that that's not so dissimilar to calling on nothing but water. It isn't. It isn't. <laughs> that's and exactly what I'm doing. It isn't. And, and and it's also a question of how you invite things in. Uh, there's another ritual mm -hmm. uh, that we do that has gotten common a couple of times, that, and both good and bad, depending on people's mm -hmm. backgrounds, where instead of, you know, uh, doing the calling the quarters, calling the elements, la da da well, rather than just saying, hey, stand at the gate and uh, protect us and lend your power, blah, 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 we actually create four pathways from the directions to the center and basically turn it into an elemental crossroads asking for 
the the power of the elements and those elementals that are willing to join us for the work to to join us in the circle in the middle so that so that uh, it be, doesn't become a circle as as a fortress or a container of that sort so much as uh, creating a con set of conduits and a container to focus and bring together the uh, four elements in a different way so it it's a question of are you willing to to trust that uh, these spirits that you've worked with uh, are actually going to be there for you or not? Or, or I, I sometimes wonder when people think that uh, breaking the pattern is going to result in damage to themselves. So do you actually know the beings that you've been working with these last couple of years? Do you feel like, do you feel like this is something you could ask of them? Do you, do you feel safe in their presence as safe as any human being can be in the presence of some things? Right. <laughs> right. So, so it becomes a question of, uh, and if you say to yourself, no, that's a really bad idea. They're going to hate that. Then don't do it. But if it thinks like they might answer that request, they don't, by the way, boys and girls, simply because you said a lovely, beautiful thing doesn't mean that any spirit or elemental or anything has to show up. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can. I. It's just something I've been railing against for a while, and I don't know why it matters so much to me. But this idea that if I just believe it, it will be true, and if I don't believe <sighs> it, well, then I'm safe. No. 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 <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I, I mean, belief is belief is a useful thing. But it's an element, of course. It, yeah, it's, but but it is not uh, the single most important, uh, no, nor is and, and more reliable. Not yours in particular. Who's right. to say that that all the weird shit that just happened to you isn't because the ravens were thinking about it? You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 even if you did everything right and something shows up, uh, I always I always remind people that the elements are vast. And for for the work at hand that you may be doing, uh, you can ask for the biggest thing, and they can decide we're gonna be, we're wiser and kinder, so we're going to send you something that is this big. And I'm holding up my fingers to just a couple inches because <laughs> if we send a dragon to roast your chicken, you're going to get nothing but ashes and death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the other thing is there's a broad scale and and most of the things that are willing to respond to humans, uh, it's it's self-selecting just like anything else. The ones that are willing Mm -hmm. to respond are going to be small enough and boundaried enough so that they can be okay with dealing with human consciousness and the framework of, of whatever the uh, work or request or communion is. So it's a very minuscule sampling of 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 all there is in the in that elemental realm. It's what fits through your door and your consciousness. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, nice. Um, one more thing I wanted to yeah. bring up before we end the regular part of this sure. is um, is a theme that I noticed over and over again throughout your book. And I, <laughs> maybe I'm not I'm not uh, really immersed in all the witchcraft communities and different things out there as much as i am more sorcery and heathen stuff right so maybe i'm right. unaware of this larger conversation but i just don't see it other than this book and i've heard thorn mooney really kind of hammering on this lately yep um how much western magic as we as come to us has deep roots in hermeticism and things like the hermetic order of the golden dawn and so on the, these huge ideas of elements and in, in circles and so on you've you're tying in you're very clear in the book you're tying yeah. them right back saying hey this has a direct lineage here do you I, think you're going to be rattling cages with that absolutely i for some for, for some people and, and i've encountered that um often over the you know many years i've been i've been involved in uh, paganism and especially in public paganism and i honestly think that uh it is important to honor where we got our stuff from. Hmm. And denial is not a useful thing. And it's pretty obvious that if you are using most of the concepts related to the, and it goes deeper than, than the, than the golden dawn or um, uh, late stage Victorian occultism, because honestly, Mm -hmm. uh, 
all the early uh, Kabbalists and alchemists and astrologers. By the way, you cannot do astrology unless you have the four elements down pat. I mean, the whole system of astrology is basically 12 signs because it's four elements and three modalities, which is why all this once a year when somebody says, hey, there's a 13th sign. No, there isn't and never will be because it you cannot it would break the entire system. There is no way to fit it in because everything is based on this pattern so that all the herbal, all the old herbalism is is based on this information. All the old magic is based on this information. And some people go, well, aren't you borrowing? Everybody borrowed from everybody over the years. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. And there's, and in the absence of the survival of a practice from your um, tradition, every tradition I know of fills in the gaps with the other material when things have been lost. Oh, absolutely. It's this is the only way things survive. And and honestly, it would not be a living tradition if it did not have admixture of things over the time. But the thing about uh Kabbalah and Hermeticism and everything else is that in, in the current climate, it also brings up the uh, the question of appropriation and what's what's right or not. And I'll point out that uh just for the Kabbalah moment, like almost all Kabbalah that uh, and and ceremonial magic that we have that has so abundantly influenced all of paganism, not just witchcraft communities, is because Israel Regardi, um, who was raised an Orthodox Jew in a blue-collar family, uh, decided to write uh, A Garden of Pomegranates, The Middle Pillar, and a bunch of other books on Kabbalah that were aimed at the magical community, and broke his oath uh, because, you know, the Golden Dawn only exists because Israel Regardi broke his oath of secrecy and those, you know, you've probably seen that huge four volume or omnibus volume, this big, thick monster book. Yeah. Oh, the I've only down there somewhere. The <laughs> only reason that any of that material survived is because he decided <clears throat> that it was too important uh, to keep it secret. And he broke his oath as an initiate to put things down that uh, you were only supposed to share with initiates. But at that point, the organization was going to, was dead basically. And oh, wow. Yeah, the, the 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 Golden Dawn um, was kind of like a, a dandelion. It uh, it was glorious for a moment and then blew up. The if if I counted the total number of years that it existed as a viable original organization, maybe seven or eight years. Wow. Lots of offshoots I think afterwards. Be surprised by that. Lots of offshoots yeah. afterwards and before. But the point is. Uh, by the way, he got Israel Regardi got a lot of crap from multiple communities for a breaking an oath and for b uh, sharing uh, an occult form of Kabbalah, Hermetic Kabbalah, with the world. And I will point out that there is a, a balance to be had because most mainstream religions have some kind of prohibitions against the use of magic and divination. Mm. There is a dyna and within each of those mainstream religions, though he he left uh, Judaism to to and, and claimed his 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 uh, magic as being his his faith, but when you become a magic user, you often find yourself at odds with your uh, religion of origins uh, strictures around those things. Some of the most important books on uh, on astrology were written by rabbis back in the twelfth century, thirteenth century. Um, but you know what? There's a big prohibition against divination in, in traditional Judaism. So maybe those were kind of set to the side. Um, with with uh, modern paganism and the, uh, well, it doesn't go further back. I'm sorry. But if, you, if you look at uh, the Renaissance, if you look at uh, ancient uh, Hellenistic stuff, all the materials that eventually we use in magic came from there. Is it a continuous line? No. But I'm not sure I know of anything I can point at that is around today, mainstream or otherwise, that I can say, yep, that's a continuous line. Uh, if you go to any church service anywhere, including ancient Christians would not recognize it. Mm -hmm. If you if you look at things that are most sort, sort of intact, if you look at uh, the African diaspora stuff, whether it's Santeria or, or uh, Budon or whatever, it is in essence of Africa, and it contains much of what Ifa is, but it also has the admixture of 
not just Catholicism or Protestantism, if, if you're looking at uh, different stuff, but it also is the adaptation to these are the plants that grow in this hemisphere. These are the, the, the materials that we have in this place so that everything evolves and changes. I think for us to do our job right, whatever that is in, in your tradition, is to claim your whole history mm-hmm. and, and embrace it. And uh, if there's something that needs fixing, uh, fix it. If there's a if there's something that uh, needs to be clarified, clarify it. But um, no, I, I, I mean, good. I mean, great goddess. I mean, I don't know anything that matters that hasn't been passed through several hands, spiritually speaking. And by that, I mean cultures before it got to us. No, oh, absolutely valid. Yep. And I think people often make the mistake of thinking of cultures too much as a solid noun. It's much more like much, an active verb. <laughs> and if it's been around long enough, it, it's, it's, if it's been around long enough and, and for people that were ever involved with a uh, society for creative anachronism, SCA or something like that, it's like, you know, people pick a century, people, people pick a place and they develop their character in that spot. And unfortunately, a lot of magical communities t- pick a snapshot and like, like the, like, for example, I have multiple friends that are use Egypt as their primary source material for what they <clears throat> uh, venerate and follow and work with. Yeah. You're looking at about 5,000 years of, <laughs> of, of culture and uh, it, Every beyond that, it was it was a collection of city states mostly, and each of them had their own ch- variation of the chief pantheon. <clears throat> in in, uh, in in Cleopatra's time, <clears throat> there were people in Egypt whose sole job it was to uh, dig up and try to understand their ancestors because they'd forgotten more than they remembered at that point. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's something I always think about when people. Not that I'm not myself fascinated by the ancient and into the medi- medieval world. Right. Yeah, um, I'm, I think a, a great many of us in the world of Are. paganism at large have mm-hmm. a fascination with history sure. that way. But I can't help but wonder if I were to go back <laughs> 2,000 years, pick a place in time, mm-hmm. you know, how much do they really know about their own? deep ancestors and do they have a similar fascination and are they also wondering if they're doing it the right way? And <laughs> I think, I think it would be a, the human condition would be, yes, they are wondering if they're yeah. doing it the right way. <laughs> yeah. Well, rule number one, you're not, you're doing it wrong. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, Evo. I think that's a good place to stop right. for the regular portion of the Sounds show. Good. Um, is there anything that I didn't bring up, we didn't talk about that you'd like to to cover before we give it a wrap? Oh, so 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 I don't get any any, any uh, pushback from the people in my life. So please do buy my books, especially the one that just came yeah. out, and please review it because that has an impact on whether or not they keep it in print. Uh, ah, it, it, it's bad. It's bad nowadays how much uh, uh, the publishing industry is determined by social media and reviews. Mm. Yeah, the tyranny of the majority. <laughs> Which is why it's hard to get advanced books published. Yeah, yep, you're not wrong. All right, folks, get out there and buy Evo's books. They are all fantastic, and they're going to improve your practice. I, this much I know to be true. Everything I've read of Evo's work has had some sort of impact and improved my own. So let me be very 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 open and honest and say thank you sir for all the hard work that you do because i know i've personally benefited from it and i know i can't be alone thank you lonnie you're very welcome all right folks oh wait one more thing yeah where can they find you <laughs> honestly i'm easy to find evo dominguez uh that's you know my website is my name uh, and it's an odd enough name that you're likely to find me if you google evo dominguez Yep, you could probably spell it wrong and still get there. Yeah, probably at this point, yeah. <laughs> You've got the benefit of that. <laughs> all right. That is the end of the regular portion of the show. As you all know, if you're a regular listener, you can catch the rest of it by going to weirdwebradio.com, clicking join the membership, or go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio. Um, Evo's already been a guest before, so we're not going to cover the standard bonus audio thing. We're going to play a little game based on an old British comedy TV show called QI. (laughs) 
and I think if you come join it, you're going to like it. Stay weird out there, my friends. And now it is bonus audio time. Are you All ready? right. All right. Typically, the first question around here is, what famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? You've done this before. I'm just curious. Who would it be now? Hmm. Do you want to hear how they just answered that question? What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions, magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more, available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership you can find me on instagram at weirdwebradio you can find me on facebook as weirdwebradio or come join the new fun and exciting weirdwebradio facebook group thank you again for being here stay weird out there my friends (laughs) 